8th of February 2024, second video today. Trevor's just popped into the supermarket to get a couple of things. Um, just to continue on the theme of King David. And um, I want to say this with a, a clear reason that we can all have demons, all of us. Christians, non-Christians, we can have all, all of us can have demons around our life misleading us, lying to us, leading us to do wrong things, giving us wrong ideas, if you like, false visions, wrong ideas. Uh, a teenager going wrong can have thoughts about breaking into cars and stealing things. Uh, and this is obviously theft. And where do the ideas come for stealing? Not from Jesus, not from God. But they do come from the God of this age, the devil, and the demons. So every teenager can be faced with demons, messengers from Satan, coming to them at school through their so-called friends at school, from their gang of friends, getting into shoplifting, getting into uh, gambling, smoking, uh, pornography, all the things that affect teenagers today uh, has affected us in the past. And looking back on your life, you realize, you realize now that there were people who are like drug dealers, even in the playground. Every drug dealer offering you illicit drugs, soft or hard drugs, is not an agent of Christ, but obviously an agent of the devil. Figuratively, he is of the devil, that drug dealer. Even offering you a free drug <coughs> to get you started is a principle that uh, is a around the whole world. Have a trial, have a, have a taste, and see how good the drug is. And they get you hooked, and they've got you hooked for life. So the issue of demons affecting David. King David was, was not at the battlefront. He was on the roof of his palace, looking around, gazing at his kingdom beneath him, and he sees the woman bathing. A thought comes to him, not from God, not from Yahweh, not from Jesus. A thought comes to him. And he looks on that naked woman. He starts to lust. A demon starts to give him ideas. The husband's away. Invite your neighbor's wife over. And I don't think the king was, had innocent plans for that woman. Sending his officials to go and bring her over. He had a thought in his mind. The husband's away. And here he was, <clears throat> already married to Michael, who was uh, Saul's daughter. Already married to her, thinking about the woman next door, coveting the woman, coveting her body, wanting to gratify his sexual desire. And of course, that was going to end one way, sin. Sin was crouching at his door, not literally, but there was sin, waiting for David to invite sin into his life, which he did. And he compounded his sin of uh, lust, coveting, envy. She might have been more beautiful than his own wife, Michael. and desire, and he wanted her. He wanted her to come over, for what reason? Social chit-chat. And of course it led to murder. David didn't get his hands dirty, but he had a plot to cover up his sin, to get the husband to come back from the battle, got him drunk, go and enjoy your wife, 
then go back to the battle. And of course, being a good soldier on duty, he wasn't in the mind to have sex, to enjoy himself, while there was an enemy to fight. <clears throat> in that sense, he was a better man than David himself. The man had integrity. Sin. Crouching at the door. And of course, the, the, the demons, the messengers from Satan, can bring uh, thoughts into your mind, anybody's mind. A false vision, not from God, but a vision of the future. And that's what happened. David saw that she was good. Good for what? To look at? Whatever he thought, we don't know. Nathan wasn't there before the event. Uh, on that night, anyway, he was in David's life. Nathan was in David's life, <coughs> as we described on the previous video. David was in Nathan's life, and four chapters later, David was on his own. Had Nathan been there, things would have been different. David was disobedient to God. <clears throat> Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Saul had his demons. Trevor and I were just discussing that fact that Saul had his demons and God used David with the music to play his harp to Saul to quiet to quieten the demons that Saul was suffering with. When David worshipped God, Yahweh, Saul's demons were quiet. But Saul had his demons, and one of the demons, if you like, jealousy, not just human jealousy, but demonic jealousy. Not just human anger with David, but demonic anger which leads to rage, demonic rage, which leads to murder, demonic murder. Murder, threatening, threatening behavior, violence, murder. Saul had his demons. And Saul even wanted to kill his son, Jonathan. Murderous intent. Yet murder in his heart and mind, Saul. And we know a wonderful story about how Jonathan loved David and knew that David was the anointed king designate, the king to be. Although Jonathan was the son of Saul, first in line to the throne, but David was the anointed one to take the throne. So, Saul had his demons. Even towards the end of Saul's life, the thought comes to him to kill himself. To have himself killed. So, one of the topical problems of society is that they don't want to submit to God, full stop. They don't want to accept there's a God who says, do this and don't do that. They don't want to accept the Holy Spirit instruction. God is one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And the Bible has been written and finalized, canonized, to be an unchangeable scripture, which covers every situation in principle. Like I said before, a little wine for your stomach does not mean a little heroin for your stomach although the devil will use that scripture to justify whatever your addiction is with that scripture of a little wine. It's like the devil is covering up a, a greed and gluttony. A little sin for your stomach is okay. A little wine for your stomach is not a problem. Drunkenness is the problem. Idolatry is the problem. Uh, uh, false comforting is a problem. If you look on uh, 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 ice cream, 
that many people, when they get depressed, lonely, anxious, they want to reward themselves with something nice. So they get a pot of ice cream. Not just a little pot, a bucket. Ice cream itself is sugar. Sugar and fat. What about chocolate? A tub of ice cream chocolate, chocolate ice cream, even better than just ice cream, it's sugar and fat and chocolate. And very few people on this planet, once they've tasted and seen how good chocolate is, very few people want to say no to chocolate. It's certainly an issue for me and I can eat my way through a whole bar of chocolate. But I am, at my age, very careful about sugar. Sugar, salts and fats, minimizing. I don't need that in my body. Of course, chocolate is very addictive, very nice to eat. Not just the flavor, not just the sugar and the chocolate, but the sensation of chocolate in the mouth is wonderful. But it's idolatry. If I turn to chocolate rather than to God, instead of praying, I'll just eat chocolate. Instead of telling God I'm feeling a bit low and anxious, I feel a bit down today, Jesus set me free, heal me. Set me free from every demon. Now, I'm not seeing demons everywhere, but of course, Jesus knew he was surrounded by sinners, human beings, many of whom had demons. And it wasn't just that Jesus didn't understand what they were, so he called them demons. Jesus knew the demons. He knew the fallen angels. And he knew the holy angels. He knew which people were, he knew the heart of people. He knew the, the Pharisees, the sons of the devil, he knew them to have vipers, a brood of vipers within them. As much as John the Baptist knew, as the revelation from God, the Holy Spirit. Who warned you, brood of vipers, to flee <coughs> the coming wrath. God's wrath is coming on all the disobedience, the disobedient, those who are unrepentant, those who are idolatrous. And there's a whole list of people who don't go to heaven. You cannot go to heaven if your sin is unresolved, if it's unrepented of, if you don't believe that Jesus died for your sin, you don't believe that Jesus has power to set you free from that sin, all of it. If you don't believe that, arguably you're not yet born of God. If you think you can have a little sin and take that little sin with you into heaven, you're deluded. It's a lie, you've bought into the lie. Look what Jesus said in the Gospels. Read every, uh, every instance, every event described in the Gospels. Rich young ruler. He was a good man. Law-abiding citizen. Rich, young, and a ruler. Was he a synagogue ruler? Don't know. Was he a ruler in the temple? Don't know. Was he a ruler in society? Was he a business leader? Was he ruling over others in some form of business? Was it a worldly business? Was it a religious business? Don't know. Good teacher, what must I do for eternal life? And it said that Jesus loved him from as soon as he saw him. Jesus loved him. Well, Jesus loved everybody. Of course he did. God created everyone in his image. The image of God is within people, all of them. All of them have the image of God within them, even if they don't see that themselves. 
But the image of God doesn't save people. Everybody born is not a child of God automatically. God knows who are his children. And as soon as a child starts to rebel, which is what I did at 15, I was lost. I was lost in the sin of rebellion. Was King David rebelling against God's will that he would be at the front fighting with the army? Was David in rebellion? We know Jonah was a rebellious prophet. He was a messenger from God, given one task, go to Nineveh. Tell them they're going to be destroyed. Rebellion. John the Baptist was not a rebel. John the Baptist came to prepare the way for the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua Messiah. And that's recorded in the Gospels. I baptize you with water, said John. But one is coming who will baptize you with fire. Behold, here he comes, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of this world. Jesus died for all the sin, all the time, for all sinners. But those who believe and repent and are willing to turn away from their sin, woman caught in adultery, neither shall I condemn you, now go and sin no more. David, caught in adultery. Old Testament. God could have killed him on the spot. As an example, God let him live. But the baby died. David lived with the shame of all of that sin. He never forgot what he did, he never forgot that God had saved him from death of sinning, coveting, adultery, arranging the, the, the death of one of his citizens, jealousy, envy, lust, rage, cover-up, subterfuge. The very thing the Pharisees were known to suffer with, the fact that they were hypocrites. And Jesus told the truth about the Pharisees. Woe to you Pharisees! Yesterday morning the Lord gave me a real sense of Chorazan. Woe to you, Chorazan, Bethsaida, Capernaum, because of unbelief. The weapons of the enemy, the demons, the demons, we call them these terms. The enemy comes to rob people. He's the thief, the robber. He steals, he destroys, and he robs people of faith through fear, doubt, and unbelief. Did God really say? A typical question from the enemy. Did God really say? But of course, as mature brothers and sisters in Christ, if somebody tells you a false vision, we can ask them, did God really say that? Did God really give you that vision? Was that dream or, or vision from God? Was it from Jesus? Does it line up with Scripture? We're not messengers from Satan. We're messengers from God, from Jesus. As disciples of Christ, we have the Holy Spirit and we can speak into people's lives indirectly. They have a direct line with God through prayer, through the Holy Spirit, they can talk to God, but they can also come to us and say, I don't know, I'm a bit confused. 
What is God saying? Or they share a dream or a vision, and we can say, well, did God really say that? Let's pray. So God bless you, brethren of the one God. Speak again soon by the will of God. God bless.